So we had the root or ratio test are the best ways overall to see if a series is going to converge or diverge. So once you have those, you can get your interval of convergence, your radius of convergence, your interval of convergence. Uh, we'll go over that really briefly here. So we'll start out with power series. So power series looks just like a regular series. So you have summation, we're adding things together. And we'll go zero to infinity. Now normally, normally a series looks like this. You add up some terms from zero to infinity. You can go one to infinity also. It doesn't matter where you start really. Uh, but we're always gonna be dealing with infinite series here. The difference between power series and a regular series is power series has a variable x. And that is raised to the nth power. So it's x minus x naught to the nth power. So this part right here, that last part is what makes it a power series. So the first part was the series. You're just adding stuff up and then each term has an increasing power of x. Now this is centered at x naught. So you can see it's centered at x naught. That's the number right there. So what happens when you plug it in? When you replace x by x naught, what is x minus x naught? Zero. So you're going to add up a bunch of zeros. So no matter what, if you plug in x naught, this all adds up to zero. So for sure, x naught always works. That's an x value that will always converge. Let's give this a name. We'll call it. Uh, Let's just call it capital A. So I'm using little a's here. So we'll go big A always converges to zero when x equals x naught. Now when x gets further away from x naught, this uh, depending on what your actual power series is, it could converge or diverge. And that's where you have all your root and your ratio tests to see what x values it converges for and which ones it does not converge for. So other x values that converge. Uh, make up the interval of convergence. And we'll call this capital I. I could be open or closed or uh, mixed. So I could be open or closed. either end. So the interval i, here's x naught. You're going to go some amount each direction. And I think we call this I have a little uh, capital R in my notes. Let's use a lowercase r. So this is our interval with the radius r. So r is called the radius of convergence. And endpoints need to be tested individually. A lot of times you're going to use a alternating series for one of them and some other tests for the other one, whether it's P-series, integral, uh, but 
the root ratio test will not work at the actual endpoints themselves. So it'll tell you what R, the R value is, but it won't actually tell you, hey, is this X value at the left end and the other X value at the right end actually in there? So you got to do, it's going to be a different test, not the root or ratio. So we'll put that in a note at the end, not the root or the ratio test. So root of ratio is the best for the beginning, but not for the end. So let's do a example now. So I want to find interval of convergence, uh, the radius and interval of convergence. So of the root and the ratio test, which one is more useful? Ratio is usually a little more useful. So I always go ratio first. The main time you use a root test is if there's obvious nth powers all around. Uh, there is an nth power on the numerator, but there's not any nth powers in the denominator. So it's a factorial. So factorials are products of all the integers itself and all the smaller ones down to one. Don't go to zero, or factorial is very boring. All right, so we're going to go ratio. So if I say ratio test, and it's been six months since you've done ratio test, probably not good, but where do you go for help? Where's a good first place to go for ratio test help? Book. Book. So you got a whole section called ratio test. Well, I think it's ratio and root test. So I believe it's probably looking at this, 10.5, 10.6, somewhere right around there. It's all training series, and then the uh, root and ratio test. So you may want to go back. Textbook is going to be one of your good friends this quarter. Um, it's going to be hard to remember everything from Calc 2 and try to bring it over to Calc 3. So you're going to be very frequently flipping back to your textbook and looking up some of this uh, older things. And we get into geometry. Geometry can be tricky. So your textbook is probably going to be a minimum to do some geometry review. You may have to go beyond your textbook. Uh, depending on how you did in linear algebra and what you did in linear algebra and how well you remember uh, pre-calculus 2. So you may be going back and looking through some old geometry stuff as well. All right, we're going to apply the ratio test. So a n is this n, uh, x to the n power divided by n factorial, a to the n plus 1. So I'm just going to add 1 to all the n's. Now when you write factorial, this is ambiguous if I write n plus 1 factorial. So the way factorial works, it modifies what's to the left of it. So if I leave it like this, it looks like you're doing n plus 1 factorial. So I want a factorial after I increase by 1. So you want to make sure it's obvious. We want the number bit 1 bigger than n, and then factorial off of that. So the ratio test, we're going to write it as a product with the reciprocal, so an plus 1. Multiply by the reciprocal of an, which is n factorial, divided by x to the n. First thing, line up your terms that are similar. So get your powers together and your factorials together. And one of the things we learn with factorials is how to break them down into products. So n plus 1 factorial is n factorial times n plus 1. So we just basically factored out just the n plus 1 out of there. 
and now we can do some nice cancellation. We have n factorial, it's going to cancel the other n factorial, so those are out. And if we look over here, n plus 1 over x to the n. So I want to cancel out n x's on top with the n x's on the bottom. So the way I'm going to write that, cancel all that out, and then try to just show that you're getting rid of that right there. So basically it's just x on the top. So we get x divided by n plus 1. Uh, now another thing, you can't be sure x can be positive or negative. So this ratio test only works when everything is positive. So one thing I also have to do is do absolute value of everything. So we're just going to get absolute values here. It doesn't change very much. So what's the final reduction I can make with the absolute value? What's definitely not going to be negative with this x over n plus 1? What part of that is definitely going to be positive? n plus 1. n plus 1. So n is only going to be 0 is the smallest, so n plus 1 is always going to be positive. So I can finally write this as absolute value of x times 1 over n plus 1. So we're almost done with the ratio test. What do we do at the very end? Limit. So I haven't done any calculus yet. Now we're about to do the calculus part. That was all just algebra. So take, we're going to let rho equal lim. And limit n approaches infinity. A n plus 1 over a n which is lim of this nice reduced absolute value of x times 1 over n plus 1. Okay, does absolute value of x, does a limit care about x? Nope, limit cares about n. So this absolute value of x, I can move out front of the limit. It's constant as far as the limit's concerned. All right, easy limit. What is 1 over n plus 1 when n's really big? Zero. zero. And absolute value of x times 0 is 0. And that was our row from the ratio test. All right, ratio test. If you have your cheat sheet, you can look at your cheat sheet. There are certain values of row that converge for. Anybody remember? Less than, one. Less than one. So if your row is little, it converges. Now, did it matter what x was? I could have put 10 trillion in for x. Huge number. 100 trillion or any numbers bigger that I don't know about. You put any number in, and still our row would be 0 after you take your limit. So what that means, no matter what x was, we're going to converge. All right, so if you see 0 for your row, that means x ceased to matter. So this, any x is going to converge here. So any x in R, the, the power series converges this power series. So we could write down, now if I draw your interval out, I didn't say what number it was centered at. The very beginning, where was this centered? It's not really written up there. It says zero. I wanted to see it centered at zero, all I would need to do is write it in that form that I put down. Did that change anything? Nope. So this one was centered at zero. So it wasn't explicitly written out, but this one was centered at zero. 
So our x naught here, our x naught was actually 0. So our interval is centered at 0. There's the center. And then my radius is infinity, both directions. I want to go all numbers. So I'm going to go out to infinity and negative infinity. So our interval is negative infinity to positive infinity. And our radius is infinity as well. So one of the things you should learn from this is that factorials are super strong. There is x to the n in the numerator. And no matter what x was, this is going to turn into a number, even if x is a really large value. So that means factorials are very powerful. It is in the numerator. No matter what x you put in, it's always going to come out as a number. So let's do one that is not infinity or, uh, or 0. So here's another power series. Before you get started, first of all, what x value are we centered at? 2. Two. And I could do a tiny bit of algebra here. What algebra can I do? Yeah, I can do what I call factoring out the power. So every numerator denominator is raised to the nth power. So I can write it as x minus 2 over e to the n power, right there. That's not the same as x squared minus 2 squared, or x to the n minus 2 to the n. That is not allowed. So I can't write it as x to the n minus 2 to the n, right here. All right, so go ahead and apply the ratio test. It should be pretty easy in this form. They're super easy in this form. If you don't remember the ratio test, talk to your neighbor. So I'll give you exactly enough time for me to fill up my water bottle. So you, sh you should be answering as an interval. So you should have an interval as your answer.
So you should have gotten one more in the numerator than you had in your denominator, basically. So your n plus 1 cancels out your n power, so you just got one of these guys. So I skipped a couple steps, but that's where you should have gotten to. Now e is positive, 2.71 something something, so I don't need absolute value around there. X could be anything, so x minus 2 very well could be negative, so I can't get rid of my absolute value right there. All right, do I even need a limit? No more n, so I don't, I can hit it with a limit just to be consistent. All right, so when is this going to converge? What types of row values does this converge for? Here's where you may have gotten stuck. So less than 1, right? So I want row to be less than 1. What happens if row equals 1? Inconclusive. So if row equals 1, I don't, can't say anything. So don't waste your time setting row equal to 1 and seeing what happens. Because then you'll know when you don't know anything. So when row is less than 1, it'll converge. So what is row? Row is x minus 2 over e less than 1. So I want to know what x values is this true for. How do I solve for x? Easy first step. Multiply by e. So I remember doing linear inequalities in pre-cal 1 class, but I think I only started at this quarter. But I know for sure that I talked about inequalities as a plus minus with a plus minus idea. So there's two ways you could think about this. Here's the two ways. If x minus 2 is positive, you can just say x minus 2 less than e. That makes sense. Right? That's basically what it said originally. If it's positive, x minus 2 has to be less than e. What happens if x minus 2 is negative? What does the absolute value do? Makes it positive. So if x minus 2 is negative, and you want to say that number is less than e, you have to put the negative on the x minus 2 side like that. If you put the negative on the e side, that'll be like saying x minus 2 has to be less than a negative. And then you can write negative x plus 2. Well, it's probably easier to solve this by multiplying by negative 1. This says two, 2 minus e. OK, so inequalities are hard to look at. So why are they hard to look at? Because we don't write them usually in the best order. I like to go small on the left, big on the right. So the two bottom lines, look at those two. Those should at least somewhat make sense. Let me write, write these on number line for you. So 2 plus e and 2 minus e. Here's 2, however big e is. It'll be that far and that far. Now hopefully it will start making sense. This interval I just wrote out should at least start making sense. So if you look at the middle, the middle number is 
2. That's where we said it was centered. If I scroll up a little bit. 2 plus e, that means start at 2 and then go e to the right. We know e is positive, so go e to the right. 2 minus e, start at 2 and go e to the left. So think about that as 2 is where we're centered, and we're going to go e this direction, e that direction. So when you see this sketched out, it's a little more obvious why we might call e the radius. The radius of a circle. How do I make a circle? You just keep going like this right here. So there's your circle, and there's your radius e. Where's the centered? A center just to that number 2. So one thing we're about to do is go and do higher dimensions, two, three dimensions. So we're actually going to have not just a single number, but we'll have a point where we're centered at. So this could have you know, two or three dimensional coordinates, and then we'll still have a radius to talk about when something is close. So in two dimensions, close means in a two dimensional circle right there. In three dimensions, close means near a small sphere. And so that's how where the word radius comes from. Just think of a radius as a circle or a sphere. All right, so centered at 2, radius E. Now we have to check individually, are the endpoints going to make it? So we'll check left endpoint, and then we'll check right endpoint. So I don't know if 2 minus E is going to work, and I don't know if 2 plus E is going to work. So that's what we're going to check. So our original was is it x minus 2 over e to the nth power. So the twos cancel out. Negative one to the nth power. Converge or diverge, and why? So you add up. It should be one first, and then you add negative one, which would be zero. And then you add one, which is one. And then you add negative one, so you're back to zero. You add one, you're back up at one. So it goes zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, forever. So it never settles down to a single number keeps bouncing back and forth. So there's an easy test to say why this diverges. Alternating series. If I pass alternating series, I can say it converges. This does alternate, but it's going to fail part of the alternating series test. What does it fail? I think it fails two parts of the alternating series test. What's the only test that tells you divergence? Nth term test for divergence. So what does that tell you? If your terms don't go to 0, you got no shot at converging. So let's try the nth term test for divergence. So negative 1 to the end converges to 1 or negative 1, which doesn't really converge to anything. So. so it does not converge to 0. So therefore, the summation of negative 1 to the end diverges. Remember, the nth term test says the nth term has to go towards 0. 
If your nth term doesn't get small, you definitely diverge. So if your nth term does not get small, you're going to diverge. So that was one of the two endpoints. We're going to go for the other endpoint now. So do exactly the same thing. x minus 2 over e to the n. Except now we're going to go 2 plus e minus 2 over e to the n. 2 cancels a 2, cancels a negative 2. e over e is 1. What is 1 raised to the nth power? 1. All right, very good. You can actually tell me the sum of adding up 1 plus 1 plus 1 infinite times. It's infinity. All right, so this also fails for the uh, nth term test as well. Or you can say, I know the sum and it is infinity. All right, so both of those fail, so they're out. So what does our interval look like? We basically sketch it out up here. So our interval is 2 minus e to 2 plus e. So it's open interval 2 minus e, 2 plus e, and our radius, r, is actually just the number e. So that's how far you can go both directions. And that is our final answer for radius and interval. So we didn't do very much calculus, so let's do some calculus right here at the end. All right, derivative. Can I split up derivative over addition? Yeah, so what that means is in this notation, I can swap the order of the derivative and the summation notation. So I can write it as summation d over dx. And if I over parenthesize, it looks like that. d over dx of. So what variable does our derivative care about? x. It doesn't care about k. Our sum cares about k, but derivative cares about x. So I'm going to zoom way in so you don't look at the scary sum. All right, ak is a number that depends on k, not on x. So ak is a constant as far as the derivative is concerned. What about x minus a number to the k power? What rule do I use for that second part? Nope, you're thinking too much. Actually, I will need the power rule, but, or I will need the chain rule, but barely. So I will need the chain rule a little bit, but what I really need is the power rule. So think about a number like x minus 3 to the fourth power. It'll be x minus 3 to the third multiplied by the original power. So right down below, we're going to have the number ak times 
And let's go, we'll do the power first. So we'll go times K times X minus X naught to the K minus one power. What does the chain rule say we get at the end? Through the inside, which is going to be 1 minus 0. Because it's going to be a derivative of x, which is 1, minus the number, which is going to be uh, 0. Derivative number is always 0. So there is a chain rule, but I don't need to write it down because it's going to just give us 1. And if you're a little bit confused, just think if I did x minus 2 cubed, what I would get is 3x minus 2 squared times, what's the derivative of x is 1, derivative of 2 is 0. So you got a times 1 at the end. So there is a chain rule, but it won't actually affect anything. Oh, I totally didn't leave room for the summation, so we'll just squeeze that in right here. All right, so there's a derivative of a power series, super easy. Not much going on. Just go term by term. All right, antiderivative of power series now. So first step, antiderivative of a whole bunch of things added together. I could just separately take the antiderivative, so I can swap the order and say summation first. And the antiderivative, really similar to the derivative, there's only one power you have to watch out for. What is the 1k value that doesn't follow the anti-power rule? Negative 1. But we're starting at 0, but not negative 1, so we don't have that negative 1 turning into a natural log. So all of our k's will be 0 or more. So we can just do the standard rule. So it's going to be x minus x naught to the k plus 1 divided by k plus 1. Would you put a plus c in Normally you would, but I'm not going to do it here. I don't have a good reason off the top of my head. Yeah, you normally have a plus C in there. All right, so there's integrals and derivatives of power series. So next up, we're going to do Taylor series and McLaurin series. And there's going to be no quiz the first week. So I'll hold off your quiz until probably be the beginning half of next week. 